It's raining, it's snowing, it's pouring, it's cold. And you braved this weather, took your life into your hands to hear a sermon about money. I want to read a couple of quotes from different writers about the problems we have as people in dealing with money, because that's what I want to talk about this morning. Quote number one, the constant desire to have still more things and a better life and the struggle to obtain them imprints many Western faces with worry and depression. Alexander Solonitsyn, the Russian writer, said that. Another quote, the more money, the less virtue. Henry Thoreau, an American author and poet. Another quote, our pocketbooks have more to do with heaven and hell than our hymn books. I like that one, Helmut Thickel, who's a Protestant theologian. And also one more, things are to be used and God is to be loved. We get into trouble when we begin to use God and love things. That's Jay Kessler, he's an early leader of the Youth for Christ movement here in the United States. Now there's some sermons you know, that are a pleasure to preach because they're liberating, they're encouraging, and the church loves to hear them because you know, they renew our faith and they strengthen our hope of heaven. We talk about eternal life, we talk about how good God is to us in so many ways. And those are really you know, a joy to preach because I'm, I'm looking at the faces and people are smiling and you can see them receiving the words of life you know, and it's kind of uh, fresh air to their souls. And then the other messages you know, uh, receive with maybe a little less enthusiasm, perhaps a call to repentance or sorrow, perhaps a preacher or one of the elders has to you know, rebuke the church you know, concerning unfaithfulness or some problem that's going on. And then of course, uh, the reminders you know, about the proper use of our money uh, falls somewhere in between you know, joy and sadness there somewhere. So what I'd like to talk about uh, today, especially it's at the end of the year, that's why I chose this time to, to talk about this. The end of the year, a new year starting, resolutions, I'm going to do better, I'm going to try to change this and that. I thought uh, maybe this would be a good time to share this with you. You know, Jesus, He spent a lot of time talking about money. He did. Because more than any other thing, money has the power to monopolize our lives and our love. Unlike sex or drugs or entertainment, money always keeps its allure. You know, people who have lost interest in every other thing in life somehow are always fascinated by and drawn to the making and the hoarding of wealth. You have very, very old people who have, you know, they don't care what they eat anymore, their, their, their sexual desire has kind of, you know, is no longer there and so on and so forth. You know. But making money and hanging on to money, that, that somehow stays with a person you know, all, through, all through life. Especially in this you know, election season, we have the candidates who try to focus our attention on money and they make all kinds of promises based on stuff we're going to get. If we vote for them, you know, we'll have more money in our pockets. So it seems a lot of times we're obsessed with the idea and I think we should stop and ask ourselves as Christians, as Christians, are we serving the Almighty or are we serving the Almighty dollar? Good question to ask, especially at this time of year. You know, when it came to money, Jesus, He didn't give us charts, pie charts or graphs, things like that, or a list of do this, don't do that. When it came to money, He simply described ordinary people and how they handled their wealth and what happened to them as a consequence of that. In the book of Luke, and I encourage you to open it to, to chapter 15, because I'll be reading a couple of passages there. In the book of Luke, Jesus tells three stories about different men and the way that they handled money and the effect that this had on them. A wonderful summary about you know, Jesus' thinking about money. The first story is a familiar one, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Um, 
Uh, we know that uh, the prodigal son, he was the younger of two sons who took his inheritance money and he proceeded to squander it on himself and on immoral living. And when he had spent all of it, he lived like a slave feeding pigs until he decided to return home to his father who took him back. So let's just read a portion of that particular passage. Chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, it says, Jesus said a man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again and he was lost and have been found. And they began to celebrate. So that's the story of the, uh, the prodigal son. Second story. Second story is of the unjust servant. Now the unjust servant, this is a fellow um, who had a little different experience. Uh, he's a slave, a steward, you know, and uh, he's caught wasting his master's money and he's called on account. Uh, he was audited is basically what is happening here. He's going to be audited and he knows he's going to be found short. So before being thrown out of his position, he begins making deals with all of his master's debtors in order to create a kind of a fallback position for himself. So this one is in Luke chapter 16, uh, beginning in verse one. It says, now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors and he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, well take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, well take your bill and write 80. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly, for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will uh, receive you into eternal dwellings. Then he said, who is faithful in very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in the use of what is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So that's the story of the unjust servant. One more story, and this is the rich fool. This man was already rich, but he had become richer and felt that you know, he had it made. And so he found out that his uh, uh, wealth was going to be increased, uh, and so he decided to build bigger barns, but the thing he didn't realize at that time was that his life was going to be a lot shorter than he anticipated. This is in Luke chapter 12. So let's go back to Luke chapter 12. 
shorter passage here, 12, beginning in verse 16. It says, and Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he says, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So three stories, this is how Jesus teaches. Now these were different kinds of people, one a young man, one a slave, the other a more mature independent person, but they each had similar ways of handling money and they, and, they ended, and they ended up having similar results. So let's go back over them, uh, the similar things. First of all, they all squandered their money. That's one similarity. The prodigal son squandered his money on pleasure. The steward with poor management. And the rich man on business investments. Another thing that's similar, they all spent, they all spent everything on themselves. Uh, there was no consideration for the father, there was no consideration for the master, or society in general with these people. They were the focus of their own attention with their wealth. Their wealth was simply for themselves. And then thirdly, they were all judged and they lost their favored positions. The son became a slave and he fed pigs and he starved. The steward was called to account and then dismissed and the rich man died and lost his soul. So Jesus demonstrated that money and how we handle it had definite consequences for them and has definite consequences for us. So some lessons about money, okay? Uh, these examples provide us today with valuable lessons that, that we can you know, include in our own lives about money, because all of us handle money in one way or another. So, Lesson one, how you handle your wealth in this world will largely determine your wealth in the next world. How you handle your wealth in this world will determine what your wealth will be in the next world. In Luke 16, 10, Jesus tells us that if we are faithful in little things, we will be faithful in large. If we are faithful with what belongs to another, then we'll receive our, our own. So what does being faithful mean when it comes to money? Well, it doesn't mean only knowing how to keep the books. Some people think, oh, I'm a good steward, I keep the books properly. You know, knowing how to save money, I'm a good steward, I, I save money, you know, I scratch every penny. Some people use this excuse you know, to be stingy or to do things for the Lord in a, in a cheap way. Yeah, it's for the church, uh, we're putting down the carpeting. Yeah, okay, so which is the lowest build, the cheapest carpeting, you know? Okay, let's take the, the, the color's ugly, who cares, you know? It's the least expensive. And we think, yeah, I'm, being, I'm just being a good steward. I'm getting what costs the least. You know, we don't get extra points from God if there's money in the bank when Jesus returns. There's no extra for that. Being faithful means knowing how to use wealth, not hoarding it. The faithful steward, right, what did he do? He doubled his talents. The wise and generous use of wealth now receives greater and permanent wealth in the next life. That's the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach us. Those who do not know Christ, they can be excused for relying on their money because their money is all they've got. But Christians need to realize that money is a tool that God uses to test our faith, and it's not an end unto itself. These three in Luke, they didn't know how to use their wealth. They thought it was for spending. They thought it was for use upon themselves, and they all lost. Lesson number two. Some people can't tell the difference between true gold and fool's gold. 
These men, they couldn't see past the glitter and glow of their wealth to what was really important. For example, a father's love was overshadowed by worldly excitement and pleasures in the case of the prodigal son. A, a master's trust and a good reputation was overcome by the lure of easy money in the case of the unjust steward. Um, the joy of giving and sharing was swallowed up by the desire for bigger and better in the case of the rich fool. You can't perceive or possess true riches and the true riches, what are they? Well, they're love and joy and peace and faithfulness and holiness, contentment. You, you can't grasp these things if you are a person that considers money as something precious. What did the young man say? And what did the old man say? And what did Jesus say? You cannot serve God and mammon. You can only love one of these. You can't love both at the same time. If money is very, very important to you, you're after the wrong kind of riches. If you cannot easily part with your wealth in exchange for spiritual riches, then you cannot enter easily into the kingdom of heaven. You don't believe me? Ask the rich young ruler. If the love of money were a physical disease, it would cause blindness. Because this is what it does to us spiritually. It causes us not to be able to see the true riches. That's what the love of money, not money. Money all by itself is amoral. There's nothing good or bad, it's a tool. We're talking here about the love of money, the desire for money. It blinds us so we can't see the things that are really, really important. All right, lesson number three. When it comes to money, everybody has two choices. We can either serve God with our money or we can serve our money as our God. That's the choice. If we serve money as our God, it will be obvious in our lives as it was in the lives of the men that Jesus described. We will use our money to serve ourselves exclusively. Our needs, our dreams, our agenda, our pleasure. We will make money the basis upon which we make our decisions. It won't be not if God is willing or not, or if this is pleasing to God, if this will advance ourselves into the kingdom. Those are not the questions we ask if money is important to us. The question we ask ourselves is, well, how much is this going to cost me? Or how can I profit from this? If that is the question you're asking yourself when you make decisions, yeah, you have a problem with money. And when we do give to God, if money is important to us, then usually we give, well, little money, or irregular money, or regret the money that we do give. So who do you serve? The almighty or the almighty dollar? The best way to find out is to look at what percentage of your income you give to the almighty. I mean, the numbers never lie. You just look at your income tax return won't lie to you. If you spend more on entertainment than you spend on God, then it's pretty obvious who your God is. You know, for the rich fool, for the rich fool, it was too late to change when the judgment came. His soul was required that night. And the unjust servant, he tried to save himself, but his salvation would only be temporary. Without a real change in his life, he too would end up like the rich fool. Only the prodigal son had the answer. He realized how foolish he was. He made a change in his life. He went home with the intention of serving his father. Only the prodigal son was restored. All of his physical wealth came back to him. All of his honor and position came back to him, and especially the broken relationship with his father. This also was given back to him because that was the true riches that he had lost. Not the money, not the position, he had lost the relationship with his father and his father gave him back that relationship. So 
How are we going to respond to this particular lesson this morning? I'm going to wrap it up. Will we ignore it like the rich fool? Will we try to save ourselves like the greedy steward? Will we realize our errors and change our behavior as well as our attitude about wealth and give our lives as well as our money back to God for His glory, for His purpose? You know, unless we want to become Christians today by confessing Christ and repenting of our sins and receiving baptism, unless that's what you need to do, there's no need to come forward in order to respond to this sermon's invitation. Only if you want to be baptized, well, come on down. Only if you want to confess public sin, then come on down. Only if you want prayers to the church to be a better person, or if you're sick, come on down. But other than that, if you're responding to this sermon, well, the true response to this lesson's exhortation will be seen as this congregation responds to the elders' presentation of next year's budget sometime in the weeks to come. It'll be easy to see the signs. People who haven't been giving will begin to do so even if it's a small amount. And people whose giving has been the same for years will reconsider and perhaps repurpose their offering. And people who are blessed with much will give much. That's what God says. But the true measure of our attitude concerning wealth will be that everyone will be giving sacrificially. Sacrificially. You see, the counters you know, the man that counted the money? The counters and the bookkeeper and the elders, they know who is giving and they know how much each person gives. I mean, it's just the way it has to be in the church. There has to be some accountability for the money. Somebody's got to count for it. Somebody's got to account for it and count it and deposit it. You, know, you have to do that. The elders know because they're in charge of the, you know, the leadership of the church. So somebody's got to know this stuff. But I'll tell you, only God knows who is giving sacrificially, because only God knows the heart. And sacrificial giving is what pleases Him because it is the type of giving that is motivated by love and faith rather than duty and habit. As far as this congregation is concerned, our motto for giving in 2016 should be not equal giving, but equal sacrifice because not everybody can give equally, but everybody can give sacrificially. So I pray that you will put your wealth into the service of the Lord, and if there's anyone who needs baptism or prayer or restoration also, then I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.